Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Narrator podcast. I am your host Kaival Lyapte and I am back with another episode. Today we are going to talk about Twisp which is a cloud native distributed financial ledger which combines the amazing properties of a distributed database and relational world. And to do that I have Michael with me who co-founded Twisp to solve all the interesting challenges that come from a financial system domain. So welcome Michael I'm really excited to have you today and let's start with a little bit of introduction about yourself and how did you end up creating this Hey Kamala thank you for having me on and my name is Mike Parsons I'm the CTO and co-founder of Twist I've been a software engineer since 2004 I got my start in embedded systems working on positive train control systems around that time the web 2.0 was starting to take off and I made a career transition worked for a company called Seamless where we did real time e-commerce ordering food online and then more recently started working in fintech through simple.com around the 2013 time frame and then mm-hmm. at our parent bank and there I got exposed to a world of how money works in the United States there it's it, and the trite and funny explanation is it's all files and databases all the way down and it's taking this collection of Byzantine essentially replication protocols and turning them into something that a customer or a regular person can understand and feel confident about was what got me into trying to understand the financial systems trying to understand accounting mm-hmm. especially as it relates to providing like a lineage of i see a balance I looked at the transactions, they don't add up. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and so that's really good. What got me into ledger systems is how can we bring clarity to end users, to customers? And how do we be able to explain things? Like we make a decision at some point in time. Can we explain that decision mm-hmm. by examining the lineage of the data? And as an engineer, what primitives and what guarantees do I need to have in my toolbox to be able to build and be useful to? Yeah, that makes sense. And the problems that you mentioned with the traditional financial systems and ensuring correctness and making sure you are doing the right thing is such a critical thing. And I've faced it once while working on a billing system, and it's really painful for a developer, especially when you are not coming from a finance background and accounting background, and you don't understand a lot of terms. We want to. go there a little bit understand what primitives this provides but before we do that let's start very basic here right because i guess very few of our viewers would be understanding those terms that we are going to use today so what do we mean by ledger database because ledger might be like a overloaded term and different people from finance background from technology background might understand it differently let's yeah. define what do we mean by distributed ledger system Yeah, I think the best answer to that question is actually on the QLDB Amazon's ledger database website. Mm-hmm. And the way they describe a ledger database is as a database that provides an immutable, transparent and cryptographically verifiable transaction log owned by a central authority. And so you could start breaking that down into its essence. Immutable meaning we we only write new things mm-hmm. to this data store that we have. that it's transparent that we can take a look at a record from its inception to its current state and understand all of its intermediate states between the beginning and now now being the relative time term and then cryptographically verifiable i don't think this is actually as important but what essentially what this is is a way to assure that this was an immutable system meaning because there's things like encrypt like signing a row or using a hash chain we can verify that there are no records missing or nothing was altered uh, between the beginning and the current state but that i think the key piece is that it's immutable and that it's transparent we understand what happened from beginning to end and so you can find a lot of different ledger databases that fit that definition if you look at QLDB that's exactly what they are they are a merkle tree as a service you can look at blockchain is obviously a form of a ledger database with with a consensus model that uh, allows 
uh, non-trusted parties to post entries to that ledger. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of uh, different ways to fulfill that definition. And we can get into some of the traditional approaches, I think, that we did at Simple was use a relational database. We used Postgres, and Postgres is, uh, is an awesome SQL database, open source, and very well understood in the industry. And so one way to implement something that would fit maybe that immutable and transparent aspect would be to have some sort of table that's, let's say, a transaction table. It allows only inserts. That transaction table might have some sort of partition or identifier that identifies what account I'm posting it to. So maybe that's a primary key. And we can use that primary key as a way to take exclusive locks. So we can lock an account to post transactions to it. So we can have some sort of serializable guarantee about the account entries that are landing for a particular account. And then you could have on the database permissions set up so that updates and deletes are disallowed. You could have extensions that run the rows themselves through a hashing algorithm and new entries get the prior entries hashed as mm -hmm. part of its hash chain. And you yeah. can implement entirely at the OLTP layer uh, a ledger database. You could, if you look at Postgres as implementation details, you can go a step further and you can try to squint at Postgres's uh, MV setup and look at that and you can see a ledger. Uh, when you do an update on a record, for example, in Postgres, it doesn't actually change some data on a file. It writes a new record with a version and it has all, all the information from the prior record and plus the changes in the new record. So if you start switching at MVC systems in the right way, you find a way to fulfill the ledger database. So ledger databases are pervasive and they're also in places that you would not necessarily expect. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think, a very clear definition. And the core point that you mentioned is it's like an append only log of transactions and it's you're not mutating anything. It's all immutable. And that's the yeah. core property. And then building all those protection mechanisms such that there's no mutation happening and how do you ensure that correctness by hashing the previous chain and all that. It does sound similar to me, something like blockchain while I was reading that white paper. Is it the same concept, just in a different setup? Yeah, so I think the biggest distinction between a blockchain and a ledger database would be the who it's distributed to and who is allowed to post to it. Who it's distributed to, ledger databases are typically owned by a central authority. What does that mean? It means that if I'm offering a service and I have a ledger database, what goes in that database is from me. Whereas if you compare it to Bitcoin, for example, it's uh, anybody who is solving a hash problem and yeah. coming up with a solution and getting rewarded in order to verify transactions that are going into the system. Yeah. So that that's also an important distinctive, but a lot of the underlying and underpinning mechanics of the systems are actually the same. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So the authority changes, like it's one is peer to peer and one is the central authority it owns everything. It can decide what yeah. to do. Okay. That makes sense. You briefly mentioned about how did you, you know, implement similar system using Postgres, which is like a traditional relational database system, which is quite powerful, but still it has some bottlenecks. What were the challenges that you faced along the way that you thought, okay, let's go distribute it? Yeah. When Simple got acquired by BVA in 2017, my co-founder and I led a lot of the integration with, with that bank. And their entire premise was we are going to offer banking as a service platform and Simple is going to be like the first customer for that. So we spent a lot of time helping them define the APIs that you need to do banking, a lot of the APIs you need to do accounting with. And after that effort was over for Simple, Jared and I moved up to the parent company, worked on that open platform team to productize it for for general use from external customers. And one of the issues that we faced there was we had this API, it was, was a mess to be honest. And so we built a product layer that would be able to present this API in a very nice way. 
we ended up leveraging us's managed services like API Gateway, Lambdas, et cetera. And we delivered that pretty quickly. And the our engineering leadership brought to us this idea of what would it take to do a book transfer between Mexico City and Madrid? Now, I'll give you a, a little bit of a, a insight on how big banks work. Big banks mostly rely on mainframes these days. And in BB case, they had a mainframe in Mexico City and a mainframe in Madrid. So if they wanted to do a transfer between uh, their Madrid and Mexico City operations, what they'd have to do is a wire transfer. They would have to wire money across across from Spain to Mexico or vice versa. So what we were thinking about was, okay, blockchain exists, uh, but what would it look like? What would it look like to do that in a non-blockchain way? And the area that we felt was the most pressing was if we're going to build an accounting system and a ledger system, we need to have the right database that underpins it. And, And given that we were a small team, less than 10 people, that we didn't have a massive operational burden because we had chosen to use managed services, we were starting looking for databases and that kind of felt fit that same mold. And so we looked at managed Postgres solutions, like RDS. We yeah. looked at Aurora. The things that we felt was missing with those particular solutions was Aurora is very high performance, but it's still centrally located yeah. across a few availability zones, but it's not really a distributed system. Yeah, There's an administrative overhead. You're still managing a SQL database using SQL, defining security policies managing credentials, and ultimately having a stateful connection model, meaning there's a pool of connections that can only go to one service that's doing the rights, and you have you have some pretty fundamental throughput limits there. So we were looking at that management overhead and some of the downsides on a SQL-based solution. We started looking at Dynamo, which seemed to have the inverse strengths, right? And it's very, very high throughput, very high scale. You can go from zero to millions of transactions per second without doing much, but completely managed. We don't have to have a a DBA. We don't have to have an expert in how to configure Dynamo. Pretty much anyone, it's interface is very simple. It takes some primitive data structures and it stores it for you. But the downsides were like, the exact opposite of SQL, like indexes are a thing, but they're asynchronous. You can't rely on read after write semantics. Yeah. So there's no schemas. You have to come up with your own strategy there. Transactions at the time was 25 objects it could be committed in a transaction. We're used to working as, as engineers who are working with relational systems with interactive transactions and having good control over what's getting committed atomically. So there's a number of safety features that we felt that a relational database offers that Dynamo wasn't offering. Mm -hmm. And so we were thinking about that problem a lot. And by the time we left BBA, we hadn't resolved that issue. But one thing that we had kept seeing over and over again is every time you want to build a financial product, you start from this same ground zero. I need to build an accounting ledger. So I need to go find the database and then I need to add these primitives to build the accounting ledger. And then I need to build some financial primitives on top of those ledger primitives to keep track of balances. And then finally I can build the thing that I want to build. And that to us was just the, the big problem with ledger databases. First, there wasn't a ton of options. And then second, what you really want is to write in cloud formation and say, oh, I have some accounts now and I have some transactions and I have these kind of balances and it all just exists and have that productivity boost. So that was the impetus for starting Twist was to provide that service. Yeah, sounds good. And these are really, it's like a story, like how you are trying to solve a problem and then you go out on a hunting like adventure and you look at what database would suit my use case and then you figure out, okay, this is the one, but it has some problems, right? So DynamoDB is like an amazing database and it takes away a lot of operational overhead from you and gives you like this simple API that is ready to use for your production use cases. 
which makes a lot of sense. I'm still curious to dive a little deeper on what other databases at that time did you evaluate, for example. So you mentioned RDS, like Amazon Aurora, but there is a clear problem because it's like still one database, at least for the rights. And you can, of course, scale reads and all that, but it's still a lot of operational overhead there. There was DynamoDB, which you, of course, chose. How about distributed SQL databases? Was there a like a database that you evaluated, something like, like CockroachDB that would have given a little bit more control on the correctness and the consistency guarantees and things like that, while still taking yeah. away the operational workload from you? Yeah, I mean, we, we did investigate Cockroach as well. The, at the time, Cockroach's performance wasn't quite where we needed it to be in terms of mm. latency for types of transactions we were doing. We also looked at some, there's a company called Planet Scale. They, the folks behind that had a MySQL sharding infrastructure that we looked at. We had been looking at those types of systems for Simple as well. Okay. Simple was operating on a single Postgres node, essentially, for each of its services. And we were reaching the point where we felt like sharding by account was going to be a required problem. We had been investigating these distributed databases for some time. The difficulty with a lot of these distributed systems and using SQL databases in particular is in a double entry accounting system, that you'll have typically like in a banking scenario, you'll have high cardinality accounts, which would be like end users. So there's millions of those accounts. And then you'll have low cardinality accounts, like settlement accounts. And when you're doing double entry, you're booking against at least two accounts, a, a zero sum amount, a debit on one side, a credit on another in the most simple case. Yeah. And so when you look at those types of accounts, and that type of account structure, what you run into is these low cardinality accounts become a bottleneck in the system, meaning I'm posting lots of transactions and I have to take a lock on this settlement account often. And so the throughput goes way down on those use cases. This is a problem that's just like generally going to happen on any database system. But the difficulty was is there wasn't a great way to both partition these high cardinality accounts and perhaps partition the individual settlement accounts without doing some not easily grokkable things to the, <laughs> to the schemas and how you're posting transactions, right? And, and so these problems of repeating themes that we kept running into is, is when you're running into situations where you have to do a lot of transactions in a short amount of time, these low cardinality accounts become a big bottleneck. And, and so... One of the problems that, that we were trying to address is that specific problem in our own technology choices. We read a lot of papers as well on not only these database systems, but transaction isolation models, how to, how to post high throughput transactions. One database, ledger database that's solving that particular problem directly is Tiger Beetle. Tiger Beetle is doing doing a lot around the storage layer. How do we slam transactions through as fast as possible for the, to solve that particular problem? So there's a lot of emerging technologies out there that either solve a specific problem that you need to solve or solve this general distributed problem. And the challenge we had in the 2017 timeframe was we didn't have a lot of choices and that were fitting the low management overhead piece of this. So with Packrate, you're still managing a, a cluster, for example. You're, mm. You've got to deploy it in some way. You, at that time and probably today, still, you're using Kubernetes. Kubernetes and stateful services is, is and you ask the DevOps folks, that's, yeah. that's something that's like the hardest problem, right? So it was really forcing our hand to pick something that was managed by one of the cloud providers. And we were an AWS shop, and so... Naturally, naturally, we had to choose between basically Aurora and Dynamo. And we felt that Dynamo had the best management char characteristics plus performance. Yeah, very interesting. And that, that does make sense, right? Because you have to make some decisions based on what you have currently and understanding different dimensions as well. As you mentioned, if you, if you go with CockroachDB, at least at that point in time, you still have to manage 
the the Kubernetes infrastructure and all that. And so yeah. that was still a pain. So that does make sense because Dynamo is still an amazing database. And but how did you go about convincing yourself that this is the right thing to do? Because since Dynamo DB still lacked some of the interesting properties that you still need from a financial database, right? So how did you go about convincing yourself that, okay, we should implement something on our own and still use Dynamo for our storage layer? Yeah, and that's an awesome question. A lot of this was scratching our own itch. We had been working in FinTech at a startup with Simple for six plus years, and then at BBA for another year and a half. And we, Jared and I were a little bit burnt out from the whole banking as a service and offering consumer banking and just the whole industry, which is a story into itself. Basic banking is super weird because a person can decide, oh, your program's too risky, it's done. And now you can alert and you have to go implement the next best thing and to keep your business alive. So it was very stressful. So we knew we wanted to do something with Dynamo. We knew that we wanted to do this ledger thing. So we started building those missing features to allow us to feel comfortable building a system on top of Dynamo. We had a consulting company at the time. It was our 20% time project. Jared spent a great deal of time trying to discover the right ways to build an interactive transaction system on Dynamo. And when you say that, it's kind of insane, right? Like, like, <laughs> yeah. And how do you, so we're doing some consulting and we're, we're reading these papers and there's a ton of, there's just a ton of great open source work in that, in academia from computer scientists, like, who are working on the cockroaches of the world, right? They're trying to figure out how to do how to do hyper logical clocks and get the best of a wall clock and a logical clock in order to have timestamps that you can use for transaction isolation. And there's awesome work in that. And there's awesome transactional models that have been published. And we implemented some on top of Dynamo. We we implemented a paper called TikTok uh, as our transaction isolation model. We implemented a number of, of different optimistic concurrency models and played around with it because sometimes when you're reading a paper, they're not building on top of Dynamo. They're usually building off of some yeah. multi-core computer system that's some sort of control mechanism for them. And so you're, you're reading these papers and you're trying to adapt ideas to the tools you want to use. And one of them, uh, one of these papers was um, the Hackathon paper from Microsoft Research. And it's an optimistic concurrency control, like lock free transaction model that can give you both snapshot isolation and a form of serialized isolation. And they use this, use this transaction model in, in their SQL server and memory as the transaction model. So it's like battle tested. And Jared's working on these transaction models and he says, you know what? If you look at Lambda and Dynamo, do you really have a multi-core shared memory <laughs> system? <laughs> like, can we take the same thing and does Dynamo give us the same, give us enough guarantees with their, and for their put, put record operation to implement this algorithm on top of it? Yeah. Um, and the answer turned out to be yes. And, and so that was like a, our big first step was, okay, now we have a way to do interactive transactions. We have a way to have an MVCC system on top of Dynamo using Dynamo as essentially as a storage layer, how do we start, how do we start iterating and building confidence in that system? So yeah, so that's where we started building testing frameworks and started thinking about raising money and having folks do some formal verification and things of that nature to start building confidence and yeah, we could build systems on this and it's going to be correct. And then we started building systems on top of it to sell and our confidence was pretty, we started building internal confidence. Yeah, I can actually go operate this system. I can put a product on top of it and I can feel confident in, in its performance characteristics and the types of guarantees it's giving me. Uh, yeah, very cool. And you mentioned a lot of technical things there and I'm very curious to know more about them. 
But before we do that, I have two questions more from a product perspective. You mentioned that you talked about scale and performance and the latency guarantees that you needed. So at that time, what kind of scale you were working at or looking at to solve? Yeah, we're running our own consulting company and doing this startup. And so our scale was zero. <laughs> but our, our, our experience was millions of accounts, hundreds of thousands of transactions every day in small time windows. And so we had a sense of what type of scale that we were experiencing challenges with Postgres and we wanted to be able to 10x that. Okay. Um, and then with the, with 10xing it, you don't want it. It doesn't matter if you have 10x the throughput, the experience sucks for the user because they're waiting forever. We want to have that tail latency be pretty constant as you're growing big. And that's one of the beautiful things about Dynamo is that it actually behaves that way. And that was our goal was, could we operate a simple neobank at 10 times its scale and do that with the system? And so that, yeah. that's where we built all of our benchmarking and all of our tooling around was to be able to manage that type of scale. Interesting. Yeah. And the other question is about who, so we talked about like ledger database, right? Who uses such a database? Like de definitely there is like financial systems, but are there other use yeah. cases where ledger databases would make sense? Yes, there's tons of use cases. So anytime you are tracking an asset of some kind, let's say you're doing shipping or you have an inventory or you're doing some sort of ordering, you'll want to have some sort of accounting system, some sort of management system to know how much of this thing I've had, when did I get it? Am I expecting to get something else? How much am I expecting? When is it going to land? Ledger databases and accounting systems are an ideal primitive for any sort of resource management. Another use case would be billing. Let's say you are an electric company and you're billing kilowatts per hour, right? Mm -hmm. An accounting mm -hmm. system is going to keep you keeping track of that. So there's a ton of, there's a ton of trade or commerce related things that aren't necessarily strictly financial, but are more like a allocation of resources and they have those resources have units. You can treat that as an accounting problem. Interesting. One use case came to my mind. Let me know if ledger database would make sense for this. So let's say I have this IoT business where I, I have these scooters like from Lime or something, and I have like little SIM cards placed in there. And these SIM cards have some data usage. So can I use ledger databases to track the data usage and put some data limits on top of it and kind of bill each of the scooter usage with the SIM card company? Yeah, so essentially like the scooter might have some Wi-Fi device that's enabled to give the, them access to data. Uh, a ledger database might make sense. In an IoT use, those, those, those have their own challenges of what happens when it goes offline, mm -hmm. but you can still use the product, right? Yeah. So sometimes you might have to build, you might have to distribute a ledger with the device itself that's replicating mm -hmm. its state back to some uh, primary system. And then how do you trust those devices are reporting back the right numbers. Exactly. A ledger database might be an ideal set of primitives for this, and it might be a ledger database on each device and a, a replication protocol to some primary ledger database that rolls all this data up to, uh, to present it for billing purposes or analysis. I asked this question because I worked on one of such systems and we didn't use a ledger database and we definitely had a lot of challenges with billing and doing the right thing and not over counting and under counting and all that. Exactly. Quite interesting. Recon reconciliation is one of the biggest challenges of any of those systems. I worked for a company briefly. They had uh, vending machines that had a card terminal in them. And this is the exact problem. The card terminal talks to some gateway. The gateway saying, here's this fleet of devices. Here's what each one did. And then you're querying the devices themselves to see what they thought they did and like trying to match things up. And it's a world of pain, right? <laughs> yeah. Ledgers can definitely help in that regard. Yeah. So I IoT use cases are super fun. I love thinking about those a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Since we're talking a lot about primitives, right? So as a developer, let's assume I'm building something like this, like just we talked about the IoT application. What are the primitives that I should know about before even starting to think 
about using a ledger database. Yeah, there you're in the domain of accounting typically. And so in the domain of accounting, you're going to have a few different primitives. You're going to have accounts, which is like the root word, right? And what an account is basically an identifier for where I'm going to book transactions or entries to, which is the second key primitive is journal entries. And what is a journal entry? A journal entry is just, I wrote down an amount and and maybe gave it a label and I'm booking it to a particular journal on a particular account and, and I'm just doing that. So journaling is writing these discrete financial events that occurred. So we have accounts, we have journal entries, we have journals, which are groupings of journal entries. Those are like the big three. You have transactions, which might be groupings of journal entries, meaning I'm in a double entry system. So I need a way to write two entries into different accounts. And so a transaction is a grouping of journal entries. So that's a big primitive to use. And then accounts and accounting has what's called a chart of accounts, meaning there's a relationship and it might be hierarchical between one account and it might have a, a parent account somewhere that's like an aggregation of, of all of its children. So a chart of accounts is another concept that you need to be able to understand in that system. And how do you book an entry against an account and know that account has a balance and maybe some higher level account also has a balance that changes. And so balance is a, is also a primitive and balances can be a total aggregation or they could be, maybe they could be filtered. A balance could be only this type of journal entry booked on these accounts is, is also a property of a balance. So you have all these different accounting primitives that you need to compose together based on the use case that you're interacting with, mm-hmm. or maybe based on the holistic system that you're dealing with as well. I'm offering a banking service. We have CH, we have cards, we have chip deposits. How do I compose these different primitives together so that they can produce one balance that makes sense? How do I differentiate between a transaction that has occurred for sure versus a transaction that's in flight? Like when you go to Starbucks and swipe your card, to you, logically, that's one transaction, but on the underlying financial network, that could be one to five transactions or 10 transactions, depending on yeah. what happens during the life cycle of that card swipe. And so how do you represent balances in sort of layers? Like these are things in flight. These are things that are settled. These are things in the future. So we call those layers uh, of balances and typically. There's a settled layer, a pending layer, and an encumbrance layer. And so you have these different, these different primitives that you're composing together and interacting with different systems that create transactions or create journal entries at different layers. And what you're trying to do is take that input data and bring an output data of a balance. Like, how much do I have left? How much have I spent? Can I buy this thing? Should I buy this thing? You're using basically accounting to try to inform an end person or an end user of a real life, affecting their life in a real way. Can I make decisions based on the data that's contained here? So that I would say transactions, ledger entries, accounts, charts of accounts, balances are the key things that you'll be interacting with in a ledger database. Interesting. In a full featured ledger database versus QLDB, they don't have a notion of accounts, they just have a append-only data structure. Okay. It makes sense from any resource management point of view as well. And the the hierarchy that you talked about, one account, then there is sub-account or balances within one parent account. That does make sense, right? But are we saying that all these primitives are also stored in an immutable way or these are still mutable? And how are these stored? Is it all immutable? It's all immutable. And so let's consider just a balance, for example. Yeah. And what is a balance? A balance is, and we'll keep it at just one layer, very simple definition. Yeah. A yeah. balance is the aggregate amount of ledger entries on an account. Mm-hmm. Let's use that as our definition. And when you're thinking about 
what's happening over time. Let's say we open the account and we deposit $100. We write a journal entry of 100. The aggregation of 100 is 100, right? So version one of the balance is 100. We post a debit for $50. The aggregation of the debits is, of the journal entries is now 50. We post a new version of the balance that's 50. And what we can do with those balances is we can draw back a, a direct relationship between the journal entry and the a balance that was produced from it. And so you can get a lineage of balances and it's essentially a pointer back to uh, this balance occurred because of this journal entry. And so you can basically build up an immutable chain of ledger balances using that ledger data structure. Yeah. So this brings up a question of one challenge people have is what if we make a mistake? Let's say instead of a $50 debit, it should have been an additional deposit. How do I correct mistakes in a ledger system? It depends only on immutable. The fact that you made the mistake is going to stay there. What we do is post another transaction. It's maybe a void transaction. Mm -hmm. And it, what this transaction is, is an opposite. Maybe it's an opposite debit. So it's a negative debit. It's saying cancel out this number. It produces a balance entry. And then we post a corrected transaction plus $50 credit. And it produces a balance. And so now what we have is we have essentially two transactions logically for the end user. I had two deposits, but it ended up being four transactions from the system perspective. And so a customer service agent or somebody who's looking at the system can go and look at that balance history and they have a transparent balance history and they understand that I got from zero to 150 through a mistake, right? And they can see the correction to the mistake. Uh, and it's fully transparent, it's fully auditable. And that's where having this ledger primitive is very helpful. It's like, why is this number saved? And it's this number. And I can go look at the history of that number. And I can go look at the entries that produce that number and, and have a good understanding of the lineage of this particular data. Yeah. And that's like the, the under, the underpinning reason why you would want to use a ledger type database to have a balance. Another concept and twist that we have is this idea of a tran code. Tran code is essentially a, you could think of it as a function that produces journal entries. Tran codes are also stored in our ledger database because they're versioned. Maybe the tran code at one point in time produced two ledger entries, but the new version produces three. And so what we do is we store the version of the tran code on the transaction so you can you can get pretty meta. But, hey, these transactions that this code was producing two, now it's producing three. Why? Or we can go look at the train code history and say, okay, this current version produces three, but it used to produce. There's a lineage on how the data was produced, not just the data that was produced. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And so this immutable data structure makes a lot of sense when it comes to simplicity to understand what is happening and what has happened over the past with a particular account or balance. But what about like how long does this chain go? Let's say there's like a high transaction account or something and there's like daily there are hundreds of transactions for example. How does how long does a chain go and does it have any impact on the the way you store your data, the way you partition your data? Yeah, so in Twist, each data element is partitioned randomly, meaning we're trying to take advantage of Dynamo's partitioning to have our data distributed across the customer as much as possible. Mm -hmm. On the data itself, it has a monotonically increasing version number for any particular record. So all versions of a record will, will end up on the same partition. Mm -hmm. And then the practical limits for, for like how many versions of this particular row that you, we can store is basically constrained on how often you want to, or how deep you want to iterate the history because it's monotonically increasing. Yeah. You know, exactly. If you know your, if you know for sure you have a record of a particular version, you know that all of the previous records exist. Our indexing system is always pointing at the latest record and 
in some cases, you have to roll forward for transactional reasons to, to see if there's records ahead of a particular index, if you read a stale index. Yeah. But generally, in the average case, indexes are pointing to the latest one. So in terms of like practical limits, it's more of like a single account balance, let's say, is represented by a big int, so 100, 128 bits. In Amazon, they partition every 10 gigabytes. So you could have one record living on one partition that's multiple gigabytes, of yeah. just a balance. Yeah. So I, I think the practical limitations are endless. And because that's monotonically increasing version number, it's very easy to paginate. So like an API can go and grab chunks yeah. of this history if they need to go inspect that whole history. Yeah, and that would make it a lot faster, right? Yeah. One other thing, one other feature that we have in Twist is we actually in, we have indexes that can index history as well. If you think about if you think about a database, usually when you build an index, it's built out across the latest version of that particular record. In Twist, we can actually build indexes on uh, the history of a record, and that's useful for on a balance situation. Let's say I want to know every time the balance was less than zero. And I can build an index and that index will answer it was less than zero at entries 185 and four. And that will return you just that same. So if you can answer a question with an index in twist, you can do it both across the latest versions of records and, or and history across all records. Give me any time a balance was less than zero and it'll keep track of for across all accounts when it was less than zero. Interesting. Whenever I'm working on a financial system, like in, in the past, I'm always nervous about making duplicate calls and like item potency and making those duplicate transactions. How does yeah. item potency work in TWISP? Yeah, TWISP, we are big believers in using defined keys that have a unique constraint on them. Meaning if I post the same thing twice, Second time I post it, I'm going to get an error that says, hey, you've already posted this. Because it's a database, it's very easily done at that database layer. Other systems, like I'm calling an API to post this financial transaction, they have item potency key mechanisms to give you the same semantics where yeah. if I post it more than once, I'll get a response, the response, the success response back on a subsequent one. Item potency is a very interesting, interesting thing. A lot of times what you want to do is put the key in the user's control, meaning I construct what primary key or what item potency key I'm using to post this transaction with. And one method that I've personally had a lot of success with is constructing deterministic keys based on the input data that I'm using. For okay. example, if I have a, a file that has a number of line items that I need, I need to post. And that file is unique enough. I might use a scheme of it was this particular file and this line, and I hashed the contents of that data all together with the file position and the file name to produce a unique record ID. So if I go and reprocess this file, all the same IDs are going to be generated again. And I can post them against this system with an item potency key or with a unique constraint and the ones that succeed are the ones that weren't posted. So there's a, that's typically the approach that, that we take is giving the user control of what the keys are and, and allowing the user to create deterministic keys that make sense for them. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that makes it really easier to use because let's say there's a file with a list of line items which was partially committed or something. So I can just replay the whole file and not worry about the item potency problems, right? And the database will take right. care of that. And that, that brings up a, another option, right? Can I have a scenario where I post the whole file and I want the whole file to commit all or nothing? Mm -hmm. And that's where you need an interactive transaction, right? You want to be able to post all those records in a single atomic operation. And Twist gives that ability to you as well just like any other database. But a lot of times when you're off offering APIs, you don't necessarily want to give have the all or nothing option. You'd rather have the retry option because 
you're a distributed system for someone else and they're going to replay failed records anyways. So I think having both options available to the end user is definitely something that when you're designing APIs or systems that you're offering a, a service to end customers that you should be cognizant of. Absolutely. Since we are talking about replaying and making things correct, let's talk a little bit about the guarantees that do not come with DynamoDB and you have to build something on top of it. So what did you yeah. have to build on top of DynamoDB just to ensure the asset properties that you got with relational database are still there? Yeah. So that first one is what we call our transaction layer. And what our transaction layer is doing is it provides... It uses Dynamo itself to store transactions and their state. And then if you read the Hecaton paper, the transaction IDs are actually stored with the record, either a transaction ID or a timestamp. It's a tuple. And when we use that as our, our basis for our transaction isolation system, so we can look at a particular data record and understand if it's committed or not, if it has a timestamp. And if it has a transaction ID, we can go look at the state of the transaction and uh, determine if it's committed or if it's in flight and we shouldn't make it visible. In order to pull off that transaction algorithm, we need a good source of time. Time is another one of those tricky things where it's relative, right, to an observer. And even if an event occurred, even if you could synchronously know an event occurring at a particular time, uh, the observer of the event still has some delay between when the event occurred and when they observed it. Thank you, Einstein, for yeah. informing us how reality works. So, how do you construct? How do you construct a a time service which gives you the intuitive properties of strict event ordering while rolling time forward in a human way that accounts for relativity that is affecting our reality, and so. That's where we started looking at different papers on, on time. We don't have atomic clocks. The cloud providers have these different systems like TrueTime at AWS. Google Spanner has atomic clocks. We chose a, what's called a, a time oracle service, which is like a, basically a quorum of clocks and a quorum of observers that are looking at, at the clocks and producing basically a logical hybrid clock so you can have a monotonically increasing unit you know, of time. Yeah. That fits in really nicely in with the heck of time model. The model that we're using is for our time servers is a leaderless one. So those are the first two things you need out of the gate is interactive transactions and a way to make those interactive transactions actually work. Yeah. The next big problem with Dynamo is indexing. Dynamo has basically three forms of indexing. The first form is on the data records themselves that has a partition key and a sort key. So every record has an implicit index to it. The second and third me methods are what they call local and global secondary indexes. And those are basically local indexes are within a partition, global or global, and they have different characteristics. They are more like a, they act like a read replica of Dynamo in, in some sense. And they give you a way to define a different partition key and a different sort key on a particular record. And those are asynchronously updated. In Twisp, our underlying usage of Dynamo is a single table. So Rick would love that. It's a single table design. And the way we use that table is we actually store all of our data records in that table and all of our index records in that table. And so the index records are taking care, are using, taking advantage of that implicit range index that every record has. And all those index records are using that partition and range key to point to a different record in the same table. Okay. So that's the underlying mechanism of how we solve consistent indexes is we post the same, we post indexes to the same our table, it's using the same structure. It's just all records in Dynamo. So that's the second major thing is having indexes that are read after write. When I post a transaction, when I read the balance out, it should be the number I expect. The third big piece is, okay, Dynamo has these awesome primitives. It has strings and byte arrays and string sets and bytes sets and numbers. And so you could use 
all these primitive data structures in a key value type of way, like a glorified JSON. Or what you could do is you could, because it supports binary operations, you can take a schema language like Avro or Protobuf and use that as your schema on top of Dynamo. Hmm. So that's what we do. We use Protobuf okay. as our uh, way of encoding the data. Now, once you have a schema, it has to change. And so that's like number four thing. How do you do migrations? How do you add indexes? How do you remove indexes? How do you add a new data element or remove a data element from the schema? And there we kept this iterative process where we were like, okay, what are other people doing? And we came across a great paper from the Google ads team called Online Asynchronous Migrations in F1. And basically what that paper describes is a way to add or remove a schema element while preserving consistency of the data. So if I add an index to a table, can I do so in a way that guarantees all the records are getting indexed? Okay. If I add a schema element to a document, when I post that document, how do I ensure that all new items have that new schema element and any backfilling that I've done it means that old records have that new element. So when it becomes available, it's as if it always existed. So we implemented that algorithm is actually implemented in Cockroach and you could buy it in a number of other databases as well. Uh, it was really fun and cool to see like the folks making really big advancements in the database front, picking the same choices that we're picking. <laughs> Get to see where some of the some of the pitfalls. A lot of these papers are, have actual mistakes in them as well, so you can't just take a paper and say, "Let's just yeah. implement it as is." There's things that are missing or things that are wrong in the paper that you'll discover. The Hecaton paper has a couple of those. So well, along the way, you're we're trying to understand what other people are doing, what's working, what are the guarantees that you can get, and they start to build each of these features from. It can, it can be an interactive transaction that's correct. It can have indexes that are read after write. It can have a schema. We can change that schema. Once you have all those things, now Dynamo becomes just this really powerful tool that you can, yeah. that you can build on top of confidently, I would say. I, because if you have a schema migration engine, now you're not writing these one-off programs that are doing a scan and rewrite and everyone does it differently every time. Very interesting. It is definitely challenging. And you mentioned like you read so many papers just to understand how these things work and what options do you have. So it's definitely challenging. And the most challenging part is ensuring that you are doing the right thing and ensuring that after doing and after putting all these efforts and reading the papers and implementing them, how do you know that you're doing the right thing and your system is actually correct? How do you reconcile data and how do you ensure correctness in your application? Yeah, that's a that's an awesome question. There is, in our opinion, there's basically two ways to do correctness. The first is to mathematically prove correctness, right? You have this input or to prove this deterministic output. And there's a whole field of computer science around that called formal methods. And so one of the first things that we decided was that it's very important for us to get a model of our transaction layer and be able to prove its correctness. And so when we raise money, we earmark some of that money to hire a firm that are experts in that field. And they produced a model of our transaction model built in a language called P. And basically they could, they could run this model with tons of different inputs, generate tons of different outputs, and help us build a mathematical correctness model based on that code. The next layer is taking existing ideas of correctness as it relates to, let's say, snapshot isolation. One of the best books, and I know you're, you're familiar with this book and your audience is as well, but it deserves another plug, is Martin Platman's Designing Data Intensive Systems. Fantastic book, explains basically everything about a database. There's a big focus of that. Database vendors have what they call transaction isolation levels. And, and what Martin does is normalize them to their actual guarantees. And one of the 
artifact that he produced as part of writing that book is called the Hermitage Test Suite. And it basically gives you a test suite implemented on a number of different databases on different transaction anomalies that occur with concurrent transactions and what isolation level the database was set at. So we implemented all of those, that, that test suite with our own transaction simulation framework where we could actually step through concurrent transactions and produce the anomaly or pass the test. And that allowed us to discover bugs and fix bugs. And then we used that same framework that was running that test to uncover additional concurrency bugs that we had in our system and fix those and have a nice regression suite for that. As we're building higher level primitives, let's say our twist product primitives like transactions and trend codes and things like that, we do a lot of integration testing. And the way we do that is our APIs are GraphQL APIs. Mm. And we have thousands of GraphQL mutations or queries in our testing documents directory that's getting tested build over build. And it's basically run this query and match it against this response file, which is a great way of testing. The test is literally write some GraphQL and I expect it to produce this JSON. One of the cool things that we did is we took all of our, any example in our documents is also part of that testing suite. So our documentation is actually tested build over build with the examples that are used. So that's, that's, that's kind of our, our three layer approach is trying to build confidence with formal methods wherever possible yeah. or practical. I'm not an expert in formal methods. I can get quite pricey to get consultants who are use well-known testing frameworks. So Hermitage would be one, Jepson would be another and try to break your system in, in ways that are typically how distributed systems break. And then finally, when you're building your own sauce, like use integration testing to build confidence, use unit testing where it's appropriate. I think integration tests are, if I had to take a stake in that battlefield, it's like integration tests are a more valuable test. And, and of course, unit testing, we have tons of unit tests as well, but that's, to me, that's the level of confidence direction is how I would structure those things. Yeah. Very interesting. And. Yeah, testing at each level is really critical for such a mission critical system, which yeah. needs to ensure correctness and all these guarantees all the time. And it cannot just say that, okay, oh, there, there was a bug, we are fixing it because it's about people's money most of the times or some kind of asset, yeah. right? Very interesting. Do you know some real world use cases or real world systems that are using Twisp in a very interesting way, for example, for non-banking application? Yeah, we actually have a customer that has an insurance use case. And, and when you're talking accounting and using the word interesting, I think most of our listeners are probably not mixing most two concepts yeah. together. <laughs> but this use case is, to me was super interesting is understanding the world of commission payouts to insurance sales agents. Basically, you have the big insurance carriers of, of the world and they don't typically sell their own, they might have their own sales function, but most of their function is, is underwriting and investing. And so they oftentimes will outsource the sales of those insurance policies. And there are many different middle tier insurance agencies or groups that will sell care, multiple carrier policies or bundle policies. And then you get down to the individual agent who's like picking up the phone and asking you, do you smoke? <laughs> you know, we can get you a life insurance policy. And when a policy is sold, it's actually sold down through like this complex chain from the carrier through these middle tier agents, agencies to the agent that works for those, one of those middle tier agencies. And that life of that policy is based on like the policy holder making premium payments. And how do you do the commission split on those premiums across all these different entities that are involved in this particular policy. And so the way you solve this problem on Twisp is, is create sets of accounts and what we call account sets as well, groupings of accounts, all these different layers and have them related to each other. 
And when we're posting premium payments, you get like there's all these different journal entries going up and down the field. So you have this world where somebody sells a policy, they're getting paid for it. Typically, the agents get what's get a loan. So they get a lump sum payment for all of their commissions from all these premium payments. They get paid up front. Everyone else gets paid based on when the payment occurs. So the big problem is what happens when the policyholder cancels the policy? And how do you claw back commissions from the agent? And how does the carrier and agencies claw back from each other all the way up the chain before you have some uncollectible commission that was paid and you have to write it off? Okay. And they're using Twist to keep track of this ecosystem of thousands of accounts as we're generating new policies every day and posting premiums to these policies and posting a payout and keeping track of the earnout of the AJ over time and then doing this clawback process. And that's almost purely just accounting within the system, not necessarily like interacting with the financial rails at all. And so to me, that was a super interesting use case of what it takes in the real world to take an accounting system with these accounting primitives and match it up. Another interesting use case, I think, that I hadn't considered just because I, I, I'm more of a over the board type gamer is uh, in game economies. Okay. In game economies are essentially I play the game, I earn some sort of token, I can take that token and buy something that makes the game better for me, right? Oh, okay. Or I can use that token and trade with other players in the game. Accounting systems are a perfect fit for that because what you want to be able to do in those games is hey, keep track of balances if I have this kind of currency in the game. And gamers are also very, very particular about their game as well. If you don't, if you take away their tokens, they're almost as mad as you took money out of their pocket. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's another super interesting use case that I hadn't, just not being a gamer, I, I, I hadn't considered out of the eye of the gate. And we have a number of uh, customers in the pipeline that are interested in using Twist, particularly for uh, powering in-game economies. Awesome. Yeah, that was really interesting. I would have explained the the gaming one before the insurance one. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's about preference. But yeah, the gaming one is really interesting. I never thought about... But yeah, at the end, as you mentioned, like it's about some kind of resource management and the in-game yeah. money that you have or the coins that you have in a digital manner are, at the end, these are resources. Yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. Now that you have like a core system and these like primitives, are you also planning to build like certain top level primitives in certain like specific domains, let's say IoT or game development, that would be even more useful for specific developers in those domains? Yeah, I think for us, the most natural one, given our backgrounds, is for the financial system. So those are the first ones yeah. we've thought about. Yeah, I mentioned earlier the financial system in the U.S. at least is a, a bunch of different Byzantine systems that work differently on different times and have different mm -hmm. properties and different rules and laws that regulate them. Fortunately, a lot of those are actually encapsulated in the standards. The big standards would be ISO 80, 8583 for card transactions, ISO 202022 for international transfers between bank accounts. So what we look at those is how we view those different protocols is like, to us, those are protocols that adapt into ledger entries or adapt friend ledger entries at the end of the day. And so what we view that as is how do we build protocol adapters to twist that talk in those protocols? Okay. So that's like a, the base level of what we think about that. And the reason why that's a valuable way to think about it is you could have a potential customer in a financial context. And instead of using these guys or a modern treasury, maybe they go directly to the banks and negotiate access to, to those systems themselves. And they can use a system like Twist to be the core of managing the accounts in those systems. Another way to think about this ecosystem is not from a protocol level, but from a vendor level. A lot of these vendors like Stripe or Modern Treasury have webhooks that you can integrate with. 
And maybe you're composing different vendors for different purposes and using Twist as your accounting core for your organization. So offering the ability to translate webhooks and reconcile those webhooks into ledgers would be another one. In terms of other domains, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, possibilities. Medical billing, for example, they all have, they have what's called ICD-10, which is a coding system for different types of services provided in a hospital or in a medical setting. Is there a possibility that we could understand ICD-10 codes and provide a ledger for that? For gaming, in gaming, they're more concerned concerned about global latency. I have players in Asia, I have players in North America. How can we trade? If they trade with each other, how do we how do we have it so it not only performs well, but it's consistent in terms of tr- transactional semantics. And so that's a super interesting problem to think about. So I think there's I think there's a number of different challenges that are on the horizon where if we were looking for new ways to adopt twist outside of finance. I think there's there's definitely interesting things to do. But there's also a lot to do improving existing ecosystems. Taking the home grain ledger that you have that your finance team doesn't understand and have a hard time closing their books. Maybe using primitives like Twist, we can export to an ERP system from the product accounting to the ERP system and enable a business to close their books faster or a more predictable schedule. So that's another fascinating area to think about as well. IoT has a lot of similarities with ad tech space as well, where you're pumping maybe millions or billions of events that are representing some sort of one auction, let's say in the ad tech game. And how do you roll up those? Right? How do you roll up those events into a, a financial transaction that makes sense? Maybe Dynamo doesn't make sense for that scale. So how do you do that in a smart way? There's a ton of there, I think there's a ton of opportunities out there for companies like Twist, for somebody building on Twist to take on those type of challenges. Absolutely, Mike. This has been really insightful talk and thanks for sharing all the details about Twist, about your journey and all the challenges that you have solved along the way. It's been really interesting and I'm pretty sure that all our viewers are going to learn a lot from it. And I would request you to share the white papers that you mentioned as as much as you can so I can put those in the description. And so people can also be more curious and learn about how these systems work and the core concepts behind those systems. I'm sure our viewers are going to like it. To our viewers, if you like it, please hit the like button, share with your network and subscribe to the channel. Also, if you are building any type of resource management system in in finance or any other domain where you think Twisp can really suit you well, do explore that and I'm sure you will find a lot of value there. Thanks a lot, Mike, for joining the show today and I, I hope you also enjoyed Thank you, Kavala, for having me on. I love talking about this stuff. And if your viewers want to connect with me on LinkedIn or find me on GitHub, happy to answer questions, happy to spit ball with anyone, um, literally any topic, but especially around ledgers. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot.